Right now on Art Rocks, there's a central Louisiana painter smitten by her surroundings. Nature, color and light is usually what I'm attracted to. I paint landscapes because they've just always spoke to me and I've been painting for about 40 years. An artist immersed in his own brick and mortar business, a renaissance in hourglass couture, and hundreds of species of birds preserved in a single Baton Rouge institution. That's all about to happen on Art Rocks. Support for this program is provided by Georgia Pacific Port Hudson Operations. Like the impulse that drives an artist's creativity, Georgia Pacific's 850 Louisiana employees are driven to produce quality paper products for your home and business. With additional support from the Renaissance Baton Rouge Hotel, centrally located for business and pleasure travel, the Renaissance offers intrigue style and southern hospitality. And by the Watermark Baton Rouge, Art, history, and commerce come together in the heart of downtown Baton Rouge at the Watermark, located in the historic Louisiana Trust and Savings Bank building. And by Prescient's Point Capital Management, a fact-based private investment manager using forensic investigation to benefit clients. Research with impact. And by Ann Conley Fine Art, with the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and viewers like you. Hello and thank you for dropping in for Art Rocks, where I continue to be James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads magazine. Today we're up in the Alexandria area to visit an artist with a knack for capturing the changing shades of beauty in her part of the state. Majestic trees, sun-dappled creeks and landscapes wreathed in a dreamy rural solitude. If all that sounds a bit like French Impressionism, you'd be onto something. Like the Impressionists, what Margie Tate tries to do is to paint light and the beauty that it reveals. Nature, colour and light is usually what I'm attracted to. I paint landscapes because they've just always spoke to me and I've been painting for about 40 years. When I'm not painting, I'm thinking about painting or noticing the light in different places coming through, light coming through the trees, the pine trees or the, the oaks. With landscapes, I'm a little more impressionistic and I like to say intuitive because what paint I put down, I'm gonna think of what to do next after I do it. It's, it's an intuition thing. We have about 300 azaleas on our property and oaks and pine trees. This painting was done uh, plain air, a little more impressionistic of the azaleas there. With uh, oil or acrylic or pastel, those three mediums I've worked with extensively and uh, you start with the dark and bring it toward the light. The oh, dark is the, the backbone of the painting and you try to tie those together. This is one way that I start a painting. It's a uh, very loose and thin paint. I work my composition out by pulling out the lights and uh, making sure the darks hold the piece together. And then I make my darks thicker and stronger before I put any white in. And then continue on with mid-tones and then go toward the light. I try to go for beauty on my subject, trying to, to make it as beautiful as I can, what I see the beauty in my surroundings. I use, I think, more of value than color. Even in all my darks, it might be purples or dark blues, and then the lights, it would be a variety. But I try to put different colors in because green kind of takes over, so you can just have a variety. It still looks natural even though that may not have been the colors I saw there. I try to blend as less as I can. It might be at the very beginning, I blend a little more to make sure the canvas is covered, but then I want to lay it on top, just uh, it's as loosely as I can. I can get thicker once I've got the composition to working. In every painting, I'm thinking 
in the back of my mind the principles of design and the composition or design of the painting is the backbone. It's what holds it together. And then if that doesn't work, then I'll usually start over if I don't feel like it, the eye is going to move around or have balance. It's a good uh, training exercise to do still life, to, to get better at drawing. <laughs> I'm always thinking value and light next to dark, dark next to light, to have more of a 3D effect. I have painted Spring Creek. I grew up around this area for just about all the time I've been painting, even though I lived in other areas. And we came back here after being gone about 30 years, and the creek is still right there close, to, and just has been one of my favorite subjects. I like painting water and the reflections and the light. And uh, even when I paint it, not a specific place, people recognize it because of the high banks and the leaning trees. To make water lay down, you, you realize water is always seeking its own level. So you had to have the back to kind of lay down to, and make the front come forward. After I got a degree in, in fine art, I, I still wanted to uh, learn to paint realistically and have taken workshops and classes from uh, different people over the years. When I was going to college, I also took from Don Sinconi there in Monroe because I wanted to learn to paint realistically. And then we went down to the Covington area and there was quite a few artists there. I got involved in exhibiting. Then I've taken portraiture from Daniel Green and then William Cowick. And I've done watercolor with Lee and Zian. Pastels with Alan Flatman. I just kind of just want to keep learning and growing. The thing I'm most proud of is that I've inspired two persistently creative children and I hope to inspire that in my granddaughter. If you don't have any plans for this weekend, you might be missing out. So to fill the window in your cultural schedule, here are just a few of the festivals, fairs, exhibits and performances coming soon to a spot near you. To learn more about these and other events in Louisiana, keep your eyes peeled for a copy of Country Roads magazine. And while we're at it, LPB's Art Rocks website features an archive of previous episodes, so to see any episode again, just log on to lpb.org. Another region with a vibrant artistic community is upstate New York. And if you walk into Mark Browning's gallery in Rochester, you'll find paintings and works in glass and metal all created by the same set of hands. But while the media might differ, there's a common thread that unites all of Browning's creations. Here's how he ties it all together. <laughs> I uh, started actively becoming an artist when I was in my 20s. Mostly textiles, hand-painted t-shirts, uh, canvas paintings, whatnot. As I started to get more money, I started to buy different supplies and different materials. When you come to the Mark Ronan Gallery, you'll see a wide collection of what looks to be multiple people's works, and in fact, it's mine. You'll see fused glass, formed acrylic, things that look like big blown glass pieces, steel, steel sculptures, jewelry, fused glass jewelry. As I moved through these different areas trying to experiment with what I liked and what I didn't like, uh, I found things that really resonated with me and that, that I was comfortable with. Having a, a large variety of, of things allows people to support you without breaking the bank. 
people would come to me over the years. I've been in doing this for over 30 years now. Um, and they would, no, you should do this. Well, did you ever think about doing this? Well, your stuff's too expensive. Do you have anything that's under $100? So, you know, like I have this wide variety of things from $15 to 25 to 75 to 100 to 5,000, 10,000 and up. You know, the sky's the limit. I try to I try to keep things accessible for everybody. People who come into the gallery, they 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 want to support you, but if it's a gallery where everything, you know, the minimum thing is $10,000, they just can't do it. I really believe in letting the material sort of dictate what shape it wants to be. I allow things to evolve, uh, paint anything that I'm working on. It's, I have the idea, there's an inspiration, there's a motivation, I bring all of that together and then it might start out being, uh, it might start out that I was gonna make a bowl or a vessel and it may turn into something entirely different just basically by how the metal or how I, whatever it is that I'm working with sort of plays out. And I'm okay with that. Creativity is organic. Most everything starts out as some sort of a feeling or concept in my head. When it's ready to come out, try to figure out, you know, do I want this to be a two-dimensional piece so I make it into a painting, or is this gonna be a three-dimensional piece I, I wanna make it out of metal or something concrete or something like that. Quite often, a lot of people get stuck on, especially artists or creatives, say, oh, I can't do what's in my head. Like, well, stop trying to make it look like what's in your head. For me, it's like the process is really the big turn on. It's like a, almost like a mathematical equation. I'm doing it for me. I'm venting or I'm reliving or I'm, I'm channeling a memory or something and I'm creating a piece. I can look back out on it and say, hey, well, that's, that was not a happy painting. That was, you know, something. But someone else who's looking at that may, may not necessarily want to know that. They've already decided what the, it means to them. You know, it doesn't matter what it meant to me. That moment is gone. Behind the iconic film starlets of Hollywood's golden age and the wardrobes they wore, more often than not there would have been a corset playing a vital supporting role. Those corsets kept well hidden of course, but in Columbus, Ohio, one woman is making body huggers designed to be shown off. Unsurprisingly, this up and coming designer has attracted the attention of people nationwide, including the producers of the PBS series Mercy Street. So tell me about the variety of corsets we see here. Okay, um, this, this piece here was inspired by um, a piece of lace, a piece of Elizabethan lace that I had seen. Corsets have been used um, in fashion for hundreds of years. Uh, Women have been using it, you know, in place of a bra as an undergarment under fashion for a very long time. And typically Victorian corsets were mid-bust, so it's like more of like um, what people are familiar with, like a demi-bra. So a lot of the corsets that I make are full coverage. I started making corsets um, as a Halloween costume. I have had to make the costume of the white witch from the Chronicles of Narnia. I'm really much more inspired by fantasy than the reality. <laughs> and so a lot, you know, I'm, I love science fiction and, and fantasy film and, and novels and the past and kind of bringing futuristic elements and past elements together. I like to combine these two sorts of themes in my work a lot, the sort of sweetness with the salty, you know, just like a little bit of pop and a little bit of 
edge with a, you know, traditional, beautiful elegance. And then I'm also inspired a lot by nature, um, the pre-Raphaelite movement, Art Nouveau. This I had created for a uh, fashion shoot that we shot in Franklin Park. Oh, wow. And these are, um, I hand formed these leather orchids. I, I grow orchids um, in my home and so I'm always looking at them for inspiration, uh, color and pattern and texture. And so these were all hand molded into the orchid shape. <laughs> You know, I, I do really like the, the process of ornamentation and, you know, the corset is just such a wonderful vehicle for ornamentation and embellishment. Most embroidery in the fashion industry now is done by machine. <laughs> so it's kind of rare to see thread, proper mm -hmm. thread embroidery by hand. And after all the embroidery is done, the, the, it'll be taken out of the frame, and then the, the pattern piece will be cut out of this and sewn into a corset. If you have a corset that you know you wear many times, it'll eventually take on your shape, you know, in particular. And that's why I generally tell people not to let people borrow their corsets because it can stretch things out of shape a little bit. To, you know, you're, it's like a good pair of shoes, you know. <laughs> This particular course is a little bit more ornate than my typical work. Um, I, I, this was, I called it the Semper Edom corset because that was Queen Elizabeth's motto, which means always the same. It's Latin for always the same. And I thought that was really fitting for fashion because fashion changes so much that it eventually ends up in the same place that it was originally. <laughs> so it was conceived of a project which combined the best of the glam rock era, David Bowie, T-Rex, with um, Elizabethan fashion. With all my work, I like to have kind of a prettiness, but with a little edge. So in the center of those, you know, beautiful flowers are these sharp little spikes. <laughs> and this is something that someone can put, they can tie themselves in? Yeah, this one's a pretty extreme waste reduction. But it's totally possible to put it on yourself. I have a particular type of lacing pattern that makes it really easy to lace it up yourself. And I, I created a video that shows exactly how to lace it yourself. It's, it's certainly easier if you have someone to help you, but <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> One of the corsets that I'm currently working on is this later Edwardian example. So this is, this is an actual corset pattern from 1901. This is part of my um, Art Nouveau pre-Raphaelite collection that I'm working on. As you can see, I've created you know a kind of bodice ornament mm. here. This is all hand sculpted leather, which has been wow. applied with gold leaf. Mm. And then these are also tiny fragments of beetle wings. You can see how structural it is. It's mm -hmm. almost like bridge building because <laughs> you're, you're really, the goal really is to reduce the waist size. Um, in here, these are channels that eventually we'll be putting steel boning in oh, here. Wow. And the purpose of this is really to provide structure. It holds the leather upright. Yeah, this particular corset, I collaborated on it with uh, Scott Riddle, who is a contemporary ceramic artist living in Los Angeles. And he is a, a Native American man who kind of draws on his tribal aesthetics. And so I created this leather corset and then I mailed it to him in Los Angeles and he painted this amazing design. This corset was made for a, a fashion blogger. Her name is La Carmina and she was um, going to be on the TV show Oddities on the Science Channel and so she needed something really unusual to wear on there. This leather came just plain pearlized like you see down here 
and I was able to laser etch this beautiful design on there. Everything that you see dark here has been burnt away by the laser. I love using technology and fashion, and I, I love science fiction and fantasy, so this particular piece I have started playing around with electrical lighting and clothing, and so it actually lights up here. All this piping here is all electrically lit, and then of course here this is all hand cut, applic reverse applique work with silver leather underneath. So who is the demographic of corset wearers? Who can pull it off? Corsets are particularly well suited to bridal attire. So basically anytime that you want to look your best and you want people to pay attention <laughs> and you, you will definitely get noticed. <laughs> I feel there's no substitute for good craft. Back to the Bayou State for our Louisiana treasure with a visit to the Museum of Natural Science at LSU. That's where you will find hundreds of birds on display. While many species in the collection are native to our state, others represent regions including Peru, Bolivia, Mexico and the West Indies. The director of the facility, Dr. Rob Brumfield, introduces us to the collection and how it came to be. We're in the Hall of Birds here. The goal with this exhibit was to have a representative taxidermic mount here that people coming in could see up close a bird species. And what we've tried to do in this exhibit is have every bird species that occurs in Louisiana. And so this would include birds that are here during the breeding time of year, and then they might leave later in the year to go winter somewhere else. We also have many species of birds that don't breed here, but they come down and spend their winters here. For example, like the white pelican. There are other species that will just show up here very rarely. For example, during a very, very cold winter, every once in a while you might find a snowy owl in Louisiana. This is an incredibly beautiful white owl species that normally would never get anywhere near Louisiana. So if you'd like to see bird species up close, you can come to the Hall of Birds here and basically see every bird species that occurs in Louisiana. There are also, unfortunately, a few species in Louisiana that are no longer around, extinct species. I'm thinking in particular of passenger pigeon, which was once the most common species in the United States, now extinct. There's also an ivory-billed woodpecker, we have a couple specimens of that here on display, now extinct, and then also the Carolina parakeet. So a lot of folks didn't realize that there was once a native parakeet that you could see in Louisiana. Unfortunately, that's gone extinct as well. Fortunately, Louisiana has a very rich diversity of birds, and so you can come here and see hundreds of species. Louisiana is known for its bird watching. For example, in our ornithology class, ornithology is the science of the study of birds. We use this hall of birds to teach the undergraduate students how to identify bird species. So using a combination of looking at these specimens in the collection here and then going out into nature with your binoculars, this is a really good way to hone your skills in, in bird identification. And some of the dioramas, for example, the diorama that we have on tropical lowland forests, these are all species that occur in Costa Rica in the exhibit. And one popular bird that people like to see is called the oscillated turkey. So they're all used to the wild turkey that we have in the United States here. But a lot of folks don't realize that there's a different species of turkey that occurs in Central America looks similar but it's got beautiful turquoise feathers and so in that exhibit you can see it as well. There are over 200 mounted bird specimens in here. 
on a great day bird watching in the spring, you might be able to see 200 species. And so we would have all of those represented in here. But we also have the birds that are less abundant in here. The Hall of Birds was put together in the late 1950s. And as soon as George Lowry realized he wanted to have this Hall of Birds, he began, and this begins in the late 30s or so, amassing specimens over a decade or so of these species with the idea of keeping them frozen or mounting them taxidermically with the idea that one day you'd be able to create this Hall of Birds as an educational resource for Louisiana citizens. The Coastal Bird Exhibit, Louisiana has unbelievable bird diversity, not just in terms of species, and we also have incredible numbers of wintering birds. If you want to see a spectacle of birds, Louisiana is the place to see it. For example, you can go out to a rice marsh in the winter here and literally see hundreds of thousands of ducks and geese. It's incredible and there's really no place else you can see something like that. So what we've tried to capture in our coastal marsh exhibit is a taste of what those wintering coastal marshes are filled with ducks, right? And a lot of Louisiana citizens will be familiar with the ducks that are sort of popular with duck hunters like mallards and green winged teal and blue winged teal, but there are a lot of other duck species that if you're not a duck hunter, you may not have ever heard of. Things like bufflehead that has this incredible shiny white head, or American widgeon, a long-tailed duck, this incredibly beautiful duck with a very long tail. And so you can see examples of those species up close here. We also have a coastal prairie exhibit that features a whooping crane. So whooping cranes, of course, are a success story in the making of bringing back a species that was on the, the very brink of extinction. The LSU Museum of Natural Sciences bird collection is the third largest university-based bird collection in the world. We're really well known for that and it's also a very rapidly growing collection because every year we're conducting expeditions to far-flung tropical locales. And that's all we have time for this go-round. But remember, art lover, you can always watch episodes of the show at lpb.org slash Art rocks. And if that's not enough for you, Country Roads Magazine is a great resource for enriching your cultural life with art, cuisine, escapes and events all across the state. So until next week, I'm James Fox Smith and thank you for watching.